Hello, everybody, and welcome to Pear Blossom Designs. Uh, this is another of our ongoing videos uh, that I am putting out there to kind of give you an idea about what goes on at Pear Blossom Designs, as well as uh, some new ideas, maybe, you know, for your creativity, you know, especially with uh, fabric and whatever we can slap on it. So, we got a lot to cover, so let's get started. First of all, I apologize for not getting uh, this out sooner. I have had the best of intentions, but, you know, like they say, you know, there's a road that's paved with good intentions. Um, but I am um, going through some problems with my eyesight. I mean, it's nothing serious. I've got some cataracts that i got to get taken care of. But it does make it hard, you know, for me to really be able to see. Everything is just kind of a little bit blurry around the edges, you know, and it just, it's a hassle. So, I, you know, I went to the eye doctor and supposedly, you know, I was just going to have my eyes checked out and get a new prescription for glasses. But as we all know, usually, especially at our age, uh, my age, uh, you go to the doctor and you end up with, you know, like 10 more diseases than you walked in there with, you know, uh, suddenly, you know, you've got all this other stuff wrong with you. So when I went in, they told me I had, uh, significant cataracts and that I had to have the surgery done. So my, uh, uh, I don't really go see the eye surgeon until next month. So, uh, until then I'm just, ha I'm just trying to make do and struggle. And the other thing is I apologize if I'm going to be sniffing a lot through this, but here in Oklahoma, it's springtime. The, the, the pears, as well as, you know, some other trees, they're all trying to bust out and bloom. And um, one of my allergens is, you know, tree pollen, so the air is thick with it. And I have constant post-nasal drip, you know, so uh, I apologize for that. And I'll try to keep it at a minimum as much as I can. So, shall we get started? I'm very excited about uh, talking about, you know, some things here. And I've got a cheat sheet because there's so much that there's no way I'm going to remember all of this. And hopefully I'm going to be able to, to read it, you know, with my goofy eyesight. So here we go. Now, the first thing that I want to do, and I'm going to have to grab this real quick down here. Here we go is there's two publications that I, I love. There's more than two, but these are two of them. And I get so much out of these. I, I really enjoy them. And one is Where Women Create. And the other is Where Women Create Business. Now, the one I'm going to talk about today is Where Women Create, because I haven't gone through this other one yet, but that's okay. Maybe that'll be for the next video. Um, this uh, particular one, let's see, this is the November, December, January issue, so it's been out for a while, and... You know, the, these may be a little pricey. I think this is like $15 or something for this. But I got to tell you, it's $15. It's well worth the investment because of the wonderful articles in these and the fact that um, you also get a lot of great ideas uh, and tips for your business. So I, I enjoy going through it and seeing, you know, all the different things that the ladies do that they make and, um, you know, how they've, uh, develop their business, you know, their philosophies and, uh, how they came about actually even getting into the business in the first place. So it's, it's great. If you get a chance, pick it up. Maybe there's some libraries that may even have this publication. If you can get it that way, it'll save you some money, but by all means, go check it out. I always get mine at Barnes and Noble because I love going to Barnes & Noble, you know. I'm a bookstore junkie, you know, what can I say? 
Okay, so here we go. The first one we're going to talk about is Ann Nielsen. Let me see if I can find Ann in here. I had everything all bookmarked, but you know how that goes. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, so here we go, Ann Nielsen. Here she is. I'm going to try to get this. You won't see me, but I'm going to try to get this so you can see her and her work. Okay, this is this is a scoop on Anne. Okay, uh, and I'm going to read from you know some of my notes here. So uh, bear with me. She's been an oil painter since 2003, and she's known for her Angel series. You guys saw the Angel there. Uh, the thing that I really attracted me to this article and why I wanted to talk about it was Anne is. Somebody who's very committed to giving back uh, to her, her community, to people uh, worldwide. Anne is particularly, I believe, this is what I gleaned from the article, is committed to uh, helping the homeless and the hungry. Two very admirable uh, charities to want to help. Uh, there's a lot of it, even here in the United States, you would think, you know, but no, there's a lot of people who are extremely disadvantaged when it comes to having a place to live and enough food to eat every day. Now, the thing with Anne is, uh, of course, a portion of her sales goes to uh, the charities that she supports. And I think the thing that really made me appreciate Anne and her story was that this was a commitment uh, that she made it, it very early on. Uh, even though she had been painting since 2003, she really didn't find her voice until she started the Angel series. And I think when she did that, I think that was a catalyst for her to help I uh, feel like she had to give back and help uh, these charities. Now, I've read a, a lot of business books, you know, how to start your business and all that, because I don't have a family member who's really been, you know, in their own business, you know, especially the art business. So my information I have to get from, you know, a lot of sources, um, you know, as far as even getting um you know, talking to people, you know, I mean, sometimes they want to share, a lot of times they don't, I don't know what that's all about. Uh, I'm pretty much an open book, so um, if I've got some information, uh, but, you know, there's some people who are kind of tenuous about that, you know. I don't, uh, anyway, she, uh, the books that I read, they all tell you, you know, hey, a way to get business is to let people know that you are giving a portion uh, to charity. So instead of it being uh, the ends to a mean, it's a mean to means to an end. But do the charity thing so you can get more business instead of do the charity thing because that's what you want to do initially that's important to you and means something to you not from a business standpoint but from a humanitarian standpoint and that's why I like Anne's story I mean she's published three books and she has got her own uh, she opened up a gallery and a portion of all of that goes to support these charities uh, her story is great because she does want to give back. And I think when you have a talent, when you have a gift, you know, like art, um, I think it's, it's just almost, I think, mandatory in most people in this area, in this creative area, to want to give back, you know, because I think they recognize that this really is, you know, such a gift to have talent to do to do this. Uh, of course, we're all gifted in different ways, you know, but in this particular way, I think people probably feel more of a connection um, to other people just by virtue of the creative aspect of it. So anyway, 
let's move on, shall we? Now we're moving on from Anne. And she also has a lot of other things, uh, I guess, that have her art on it. And, you know, from a marketing standpoint, you know, probably gift cards, cards, maybe wrapping, who knows, you know. But anyway, so she probably has a lot of other products that she also uh, gives a portion to uh, this these charities also. So I admire that, and I thought I would bring her up. Now, all of this information that I'm going to give you is going to be on my blog. So you don't have to worry about writing anything down right now. Just go to my blog, and I will have the links to all of these things, so you can go right to them. The next one that I want to talk to you about, and this gal's a hoot. She is just a hoot. Her name is... Okay, Monica Madeira, and the reason why I liked her and I want to talk about her is because she is such a hoot. Now, Monica has a company called Bricolage Press, and Bricolage means tinkered in French, I think, or tinkered, you know, um, I'm not sure which which one is correct, but anyway, it means that's what it means. And um, this was really an entertaining article because, uh, and let me show you a picture real quick before I forget to show that. Now, there's Monica, and this is uh, some fabric I guess that she's going to be working with, and we'll talk about that here. As you can see, you know, I just even love her outfit, you know, how cool is that? Anyway, the thing about uh, Monica is she came from this really nice uh, apartment, you know, that she had that was decorated, you know, with all of these beautiful things that she loved, had plenty of space, you know, and I guess her, I don't know if her studio was incorporated into that or not, you know, but the space that she lived in was spacious and perfect for her. So she met her boyfriend and uh, he had a piece of property, a house on a piece of property, and they decided that they would move in together. Well, I don't like to say typical because, you know, there just isn't a, there's not a typical person on the planet, but I think he encapsulated what we think of as the typical bachelor. You know, there was car parts in the yard, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff strewn around, you know, uh, who knows, you know, what, was, what all was out there. But, you know, just a bunch of stuff, you know, that he had collected and threw out there. <laughs> so the funny part is he was also renovating his house. This was not a big house, a thousand square feet. Half of it was being renovated. So 500 square feet was left for them as living quarters while they finished these renovations. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever lived in 500 square feet. I have lived pretty close to that uh, in an efficiency apartment. And let me tell you, there's no room. Uh, you really can't have any furniture. You've got the bare necessities. Uh, you've got a bedroom, very tiny, teeny kitchen. If you can get a sofa and a little uh, kitchen table in there with a couple of chairs, you're doing good. So I'm seeing this woman move from this wonderful apartment she had <laughs> into this sardine can of a house with, with her boyfriend. And what she does is she makes use of what she has. Okay, so she doesn't have all the room, you know, that she had before. And, you know, is going to have to modify her lifestyle, I guess, on account of that. What she did is, uh, and I really admire her, you know, she <laughs> she called it, if I can find it here, exotic squatting. That's what they she referred to the... Uh, living conditions that she moved into and her and her boyfriend both uh, referred to it as hillbilly heaven evidently there's property attached to this small house 
and uh, she's out in California somewhere. So, you know, I mean, you know, that's, that's a big thing. You know, you've got at least some property and she realized, you know, that she was going to, she had all that property. She's going to plant a garden, you know, so she went ahead and she got a garden planted. And one of the things that they tell you, and I remember this from the days when, you know, I was kind of interested in gardening, uh, is you plant marigolds because they keep the pest bugs out. Uh, and so she planted all these marigolds and, you know, thinking like she does about making use of what you already have. She thought, what can I do with these? You know, because uh, maybe she was deadheading them or something where you pull off the old, you know, dead flower, you know, and, and get rid of it. And she might have been doing that. And she thought, what am I going to do? You know, what could I do with these? You know, because it just seems a shame to throw them away. So she went ahead and she did some research and discovered eco dyeing. And what that is, is, you know, she uses the plants for dyes. And she started dyeing uh, these uh, pieces of fabric with these uh, dyes. And one of the things that I thought was really attractive, if I can find you a picture of it, and it is right there. Take a look at this, especially this over here. Try to get my fingers out of the way. Now, I think that's just gorgeous. If you saw that hanging there, what, what she does is she imprints the flower onto the fabric. So you have the color and you actually have an outline of the flower on it too. And I just thought that was gorgeous. You know, uh, I mean, to have a piece like that, you know, and be able to uh, um, sew on it you know, stitch on it, you know, throw some mixed media stuff on it, paint it, paint around it. That to me is beautiful and would be, I mean, it's a work of art in itself, you know, but then, you know, if you wanted to enhance that, how gorgeous is that? Uh, you know, have a beautiful scarf around your neck that you created. Very clever, you know, because she made use of something that she had an excess of, but didn't want to waste it. And, She's also into uh, printing, and she has got a an old press, printing press, and she says a thousand pieces of type and dingbats to go along with it. And she holds workshops with both of these things, you know, with the, the flower dyeing thing and then her uh, printing press thing. And something that she said that I think is very worthwhile noting is she says that it she believes it's important. Uh, oh, you got to forgive me because my eyesight, you know, right now is just deplorable. She believes it's important to her students to learn about these historic crafts and their place in the world. Uh, she believes it is an exercise of the creative spirit to slow down and use one's hands and experience the satisfaction of putting time into something and creating that intrinsic investment into one's life. Now, that's what we do, you know, as fiber artists, as any kind of creatives. That's that's our intrinsic investment. That's that's a part of us that goes into the work that we do. And so um, I just thought that was awesome. But I, I love her story because, uh, <laughs> I mean, she just was not going to let anything get her down, you know, and to have a great sense of humor about all of this, too. And, and. Even with all of this still pursuing her creative arts, I mean, is awesome and a very good lesson, I think, for all of us. So uh, the next one uh, that I want to kind of showcase, her name is Sharon Sowell, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, S-O-W-E-L-L. -L. Now, 
hair Sharon. I'm trying to make sure that you get a picture. Look at her little studio over here. Anyway, Sharon, her story is real interesting because she has, um, be I guess because of her history, you know, with, with her creativity. Now, here's a lady who now has a rose-covered uh, cottage of a studio, which... Okay, so who wouldn't give their eye teeth, you know, to have something like that, you know, to go to and work in. Um, but this lady's journey was kind of complicated and delayed, which to me shows don't give up. If you love it, do it, pursue it. Uh, she wa uh, was told at a, at a young age in school uh, by an art teacher that she couldn't draw. And, of course, the teacher was very talented, and so she thought, well, you know, she knows what she's talking about. I guess I'm a lousy artist. I'm not going to pursue that. So, you know, let's flash forward, you know, several years. She then has a family. She's got two boys, and I guess they were all on um, some kind of an outing, and she was packing lunches, and she wanted to do something fun, you know, and so she uh, did some cutting uh, on these sack lunches on the bags um, just to kind of make it fun well you know it didn't re you know, of course these are guys you know and they're not going to be over the moon or something like that um, but that wasn't required for her to follow up on doing more of that she enjoyed it and so what she did is she kept working at that and doing her uh, cutting uh, and her paper cutting, but she didn't share it with anybody. She would practice, you know, do it, have fun with it, and then she'd wad it up and throw it away. Uh, she, she didn't want to have the same kind of criticism that she was confronted with when she was younger. So what this did is, and according to her, is this cocooned her. She didn't really go out and pursue this, so she didn't take workshops. She wasn't uh, actively pursuing this uh, to get better at it. You know, she was um, exploring it herself, and she was evolving herself without these outside influences. So her art is very uniquely hers for that reason. And I really admired her for that. You know, now this lady is very multi-talented. Uh, let me just give you, sorry about that noise. Um, listen to what, listen to what this gal, she's so multi-talented. Um, her interests, her artistic interests include calligraphy, uh, watercolor, of course, the cut paper, paper crafts, photography, and letterpress printing. And uh, evidently, she's got a myriad of computer skills also. Uh, so this lady, you know, she does a lot of things with die cuts, you know, uh, as far as designing those and stuff. I mean, uh, the work in here. Let me see if I can find you a picture of one of her. I mean, I was looking at this stuff and I was going, what? You know, that's on paper? It's gorgeous. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Here, this is an example. Here's two pages. Let me make sure I got this so you guys can see it. But, you know, I mean, that's paper cutouts. Now, how awesome is that? Paper and a pair of scissors. You know, it just, it just blows me away, you know, how something so simple can be so creative and so beautiful. So, This is, and, and, and something else that I admired or uh, admired about her story is that she's one of these people, the glass is half full, you know, type people. So, you know, she, and, and I, I think the way she pursued her uh, art is a great example of that. She just celebrates the everyday things, you know, not 
you know, the birthdays, you know, like everybody does exclusively, you know, or, you know, Valentine's, whatever. She is uh, one of those people that really thinks that every day there's something to celebrate. And, uh, and, and she is thrilled with that. Uh, so she is one of these people that, you know, wakes up in the morning and, you know, hey, what great thing is going to happen today? You know, instead of like a lot of us, you know, oh Lord, you know, what's, instead of this, what's going to happen today? You know, she's like, ooh, what's going to happen today? You know, wonderful things. I'm going to have at least, I know, one wonderful thing that's going to happen. And I think that kind of philosophy carries into her art because her art celebrates the everyday mundane things. Uh, so I think I, you know, I, I enjoyed her story and I admire her for the fact that number one, she didn't burst on the scene when she was younger. She was, she was an older lady and she had been doing this secretly, you know, this art, this creative uh, endeavor all this time before she was ready to release it, uh, felt comfortable releasing it, cocooned herself in this little uh, artistic environment um, within herself of pursuing her art and getting better at it and happier with it as time went on herself, not according to anybody else. And has become an extremely successful artist as a result of that. So I think that's a lesson for all of us. It's never too late. And if you love it and you don't have to, you know, have a, a resume a mile long and have all of these uh, workshops and, you know, and all of this behind you, those things are wonderful. Don't get me wrong, but don't feel like you have to have it. I know a lot of times, you know, it's that old peer, peer pressure. I don't care how old you get. That's always going to be there uh, in one form or another. And so don't, don't let that interfere with what you are pursuing. Just, just don't. And she's a great example of what can happen when you don't. So that's something, you know, for all of us, I think, inspirationally, and especially for those of us who are older and feel like, oh, well, you know, look, you know, I'm at this age, you know, I don't have that much time left, you know, to break into the art world or whatever, you know, that's really not the point. If that happens, that was meant to happen. I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, how long or how little time you've spent on something. You are going to be where you're supposed to be eventually. And, but the art itself is something that needs to be pursued. You need to have that fulfillment yourself. It can't come from without. Um, because if you're, if you're looking for that approval from, you know, other sources, you're probably going to be disappointed a lot of the time. And, that's not going to help your creativity at all. So where women create and where women create business, my, my two favorite. I'm, I'm going to probably have more in the next video on some of these because the stories are just too fantastic not to. And like I said, if you get a chance, see if you can find an issue. I think you'd really enjoy it too. Okay, now the next order of business. Let me check my cheat sheet here. Uh Oh, ho, ho, ho. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I know we said we were finished with paints. Not really, okay, because I can't keep my hands off of them. I love them. I love fabric paints. And the nice thing about fabric paints is you can use them on paper, too. I would say probably 99.9% .9 of the time, you can probably use the same paints on paper as you do on fabric. Now, that's not always true of paints for paper. You can't always use those on fabric. Um, but usually the other way around works. So even if you invest in paints and 
okay, you, you decide, you know, hey, maybe I want to make a, a, a birthday card for the grandkids or something. You can use the paint that you have for your fabrics, too. You know, hey, why not? You know, I mean, if you spend the money, use it for what you need. You know, and I think that's why I like fabric paints is because I can, they, they multitask. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is... And I might have to turn the slide on because I want you to really see these colors. It's it's just it's just so bright, you know. Anyway, but I do want you to see these colors. This is really important. Um, I discovered on Joggles, J O G G L E S. I'll have a link to that too. Um, these Marabou fashion liners. Now I'm going to show you what these look like. Now, if you take the cap off, you can see it's got this little tip on it. It's pretty. It's a pretty fine tip. And I love these. I, I bought a few of them um, because I had a certain project in mind that I thought that these would really work very well with. I liked them because they do have that tip. You don't have to try to pour this into a bottle with a fine tip on it. Uh, they come like that already made. And for things, you know, such as outlining, if you want to write something, um, if you want to, you know, make small uh, designs like, you know, spirals, squiggles, you know, dots, you know, this, this really is nice to have comes in nine different colors, um, I think like nine regular colors and nine sh what they call shimmers, you know, which has the uh, sparkly aspect to them. And I, I mean, after I got those initial few, uh, I just recently ordered a few others. So I've got, whoops. I'm on my way to, you know, having a collection of these because I think I'm going to get a lot of use out of them, and they're just fun to use. Now, here's the colors. This is what I want you to see. Now, I wrote on this so you can see what it looks like. I didn't really do a very good good job, and um, because I really, you know, I tried. What you do is have a piece of paper handy so that you can kind of go through and you know, get excess off, practice, you know, and then uh, do it on whatever your project is. Definitely you want to experiment with it before you do this. But I want you to see not only, you know, that you can write with this, but look at how vivid those colors are. And look at now these um, at the top. I'm trying to get this so that you can you can really see it there. Those are the shimmers. And they are absolutely beautiful. They look very metallic. And, you know, that's not easy to do, you know, with some of these things. You know, sometimes they look, you know, not quite as vibrant. Um, but these are. I mean, absolutely are. You can see how vibrant. Look at that red, the yellow, the orange, and this Caribbean blue. I'm just crazy about that. I don't know why for some reason that blue. Uh, anyway, those, those, these are really phenomenal. And if you get a chance, uh, you, uh, uh, they're made in Germany. So anybody over in Europe probably could uh, get these. Uh more easily, you know, than sources over here. Although I have seen, you know, that you can get these in a lot of different places too. I, I go to Joggles just because I get great service. And uh, my initial order was on sale. Uh, so she's usually got great prices too. You know, most of her stuff is uh, discounted. So try the Marabou fashion liners. Marabou also makes some other things. They make textile paint and they make a spray paint too, um, like an atomizer spray. And I would like to try some of those other ones. Um, 
and hopefully in the future I'll be able to get my hands on maybe uh, one or two of those and we can play with those and see how those work. But these are wonderful. Now, something you got to keep in mind with these before I go to the next thing is that when you first put them on, it, it almost looks like some kind of dimensional paint because it does kind of puff up. Uh, but it's not a dimensional paint. If you're looking for that, this is not what you need. It dries flat as a pancake. So a word to the wise, don't think that this is dimensional paint. It's not. You're going to have to get, you know, some other paint if you want, you know, like little pearl dots or something. Uh, and, and, uh, but for everything, you know, if you're looking for something flat, this these are beautiful. I, I was blown away, you know, by the quality of the product and the way it showed up. Okay, on to the next thing. Here we go. Let's see. Oh, I should mention that they're light, fast, and water-based. They clean up with water. I didn't even have to use soap. I just used water and it cleaned right up off my brush and I use Martha Stewart craft brushes so I don't know if that had anything to do with it or not but I thought I'd throw it in okay so the next thing uh, will be uh, something that I learned about glitter now glitter we all love I mean there I'm sure that you know I don't know if it's mica or what you know they have in most of these products that I use but uh, what I discovered is a story about glitter and how scientists are wanting to ban it. And the reason they want to ban it is because they use plastic. It's called microplastics for glitter. Uh, I'm not saying all glitter because I don't know what's in all glitter, but there are glitters that use microplastics. And these are problematic because they're so small, they get through filtration systems and they get into the water and they affect the wildlife, you know, the birds and the fish and, you know, I guess, you know, frogs, whatever else is living in the water. So what I learned is that there is a company. Now, that's not to say, hey, you know, oh, throw out all your glitter products because, you know, unless you're a multi billionaire and can afford to replace all of your your stuff you're going to have to use what you got but in the future if you want to purchase some okay so here's the thing i found a company and it is called bio glitz B-I-O-G-L-I-T-Z. And this company, what they've done is they've developed glitter, but they use eco-friendly uh, plant material for the glitter, which I think is awesome. You know, I mean, why not help out the environment while you're creating? And I think going forward, I, I, now I don't really use glitter per se. Um, I'm not an embosser or anything, um, but there are products that I use that are glittery. Now, some of it is mica. Uh, they, uh, a lot of products will use mica in their, in their stuff, and that is, uh, you know, of course you find that in the ground. Uh, and so I don't know how eco-friendly that is, you know, but, um, if I have a, a an alternative that I can use, if I ever want to use, you know, just like glitter, glitter, then I will look to a company that like an alternative, you know, like BioGlitz, that is um, trying to work to save the environment and give us a nice product. When I looked online at these things, they really looked beautiful. They had a great sparkle to them. So, you know, these things um, could I mean, as far as I can tell, I haven't ordered them. I don't know anything about them in person. But online, they look like they're every bit as beautiful as regular glitter. And uh, I wanted to throw that out there because maybe you don't use glitter. Like, I really don't use glitter. You know, I don't put it on my cards or anything. Um, but 
you may know somebody who does. And this might be, you know, something useful to pass along to them so that, you know, they might be able to look into that, you know, and see if that's something that they can utilize. You know, why not help Mother Nature out, you know? I mean, she's been good to us, you know, why not reciprocate? Okay, so the next thing that I wanted to talk about. Oh, now I discussed this on my uh, blog about these two fibers on the um, fiber sampler. Threadworks Legacy and the other one was Vineyard Silk Shimmer. These are so gorgeous. I just absolutely, I love these. Now, um, let me just show you real quick here. Mm -mm -mm. This is the legacy. Look at that. I'm going to try to get that as close as I can because I really want you to see how gorgeous this is. I'm going to get it over here where there's more light. This is on 14 count Ada. And it is, I used half stitches with it. So it'll go on. You, I mean, you can pull it in and out of the fabric. I mean, I did that. That was uh, just one long piece that I, I used. I mean, the sparkle on that, look at that, and the and the fuzziness, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm in love. I'm in love with this fiber. Uh, I've got uh, several different skeins of it, and I, if I could use this all the time in my work, now don't get me wrong, you know, it's not like regular floss, you know, in and out and out. No, you, you got to work with it. You know, it takes a certain amount of effort. But the rewards to me are absolutely over the moon worth it. It is, it's it's just gorgeous. And I think if you can incorporate that, if you can, you know, just get a, your hands on one skein, just one skein, uh, you're going to be hooked because... The possibilities with this are phenomenal. One of the things that you do have to consider when you when you do work with this is that when you clip it, of course, you've got all these little, you know, rayon fibers that are going to, you know, scatter a little bit. But, you know, hey, put down a piece of paper, you know, that way you've got it contained. You just, you know, throw it in the trash can. No big deal. You know, to me, the cleanup is is a very minute uh, problem and uh, but something you should be aware of you know because there's some people who just you know don't want to work with that now the one above that I don't know if you can see it or not this one right here before Threadworks took over the company and started producing the legacy it used to be called Charleston now this is an old manufactured version up there if you can see it I think you can. That is beautiful as well. It's not as hairy, but it's a beautiful product. Um, they don't make it any more like that. Uh, like I said, Threadworks took it over, and so they, you know, modified it. They made it, I think they made it even a better product. But if you can get your hands on some of the older product, uh, which they they were called uh, Charleston instead of the Legacy, uh I would grab those two because they are also a very beautiful product and have a great effect. Now, the other, um, let's see. Now, Wiltex Threads is the one who makes the Vineyard Silk Shimmer. I'm going to try to get this up here as close as I can. Let me see if I've got another one because I think I made... Excuse me, excuse me for sniffing. I tell you what. Oh, these trees blooming. I love to see them, but come back. But, oh, you know, the first month is just a killer for sinuses and allergies. So here we go. 
here is the this is the Wiltex Silk Shimmer. Now, I don't know if you can see. I'm going to try to get this. You can kind of see the sparkle in there. And, you know, of course, it's not as pronounced. When you compare it, you know, with the Legacy, no, it's not going to be. But it it definitely has a be beautiful, uh, soft uh, kind of uh, glitter to it. Uh, sparkle to it because it's got the metallic woven in with the silk. So, uh, you know, unlike the Threadworks, which is the same throughout the skein, the shimmer has got that intertwined with the silk. So every stitch that you do, that is going to be, you know how thread does, it turns. So you're going to have that that little bit of difference in each stitch. So some stitches will have more of the glitter and more of the sparkle and, than others. But what that does to me is give you a real nice effect uh, as far as, you know, this kind of subtle uh, sparkle throughout your work. So very cool fibers. Now, the Silk Shimmer, oh, here we go again. Uh, you had a changeover uh, in, in the company. And so you've got some of the old fibers out there and now you've got new fibers being produced. The new fibers right now, they, I, I don't know if they will eventually catch up to the old version with the variety of colors they have. Uh, but for now the older version had, uh, more colors, but the colors that they do have in the newer version, which of course you can still, you know, you can purchase, um, are beautiful. So you should be able to find some that, you know, you can work with. If you went across some of the older versions, snag those, you know, because they're usually on sale and they're, they're beautiful too, you know, so, uh, either way, you know, if you find the old ones, if you find the new ones, you know, try to grab at least one skein. Now, it is a thicker fiber, um, but, you know, you saw this is 14 cal, uh, and you can see that it lays very nicely in there. Once again, it's not like regular cotton floss. You do have to work with it, you know, but to me, if you can get, you know, a different effect with something, go for it. And that's exactly what you, you get with that. So those that's going to be uh, uh, something that I think is, you know, as we move along, I'm going to go into more and more of the different fibers and, you know, how uh, you can use them. Uh, I mean, what can what could you not use that with, you know? I mean, even even on leaves, you know, it would give you the effect of, you know, light shining off of it. Water is another one. You know, I mean, uh, the the uses are going to be worth the, the little bit of investment that you'll have to make. I, and I can't afford to get all these colors, you know, but I, I find them, you know, like an Etsy. You know, they have them in Etsy and some places where you can get them at a, at a very good price. And so, yeah, you can pick up a couple of skeins and it's pretty reasonable. Okay, moving on. Um, the Stitch Sampler Update. Okay, I got my fabric. I don't know what the deal is with me lately, you know, not being able to get anything done. Maybe, you know, I don't know, It's I know it's odd, but winter time is always, I don't know why, so bad for me to get anything done. I get most of the stuff I do done in the summertime, in the warmer months, which makes no sense to me because most people are outside doing stuff and they don't get as much done in the summer. I'm just the complete opposite. So maybe now that the weather's warmer, I'll have more productivity. Here is going to be, this is going to be the my uh, stitch sampler book. It's bigger than my fiber sampler book that I just showed you because um, I'm going to try, you know, quite a few different things, you know, with this. Maybe, you know, using uh, more floss uh, with a stitch and then trying it with a smaller amount uh, and those, those sorts of things. But I love these... Um, a Canson 
mixed media books because they're very sturdy and uh, they're not expensive. I get mine at the Walmart. So um, hopefully I can get started on that. I'm going to show you two books that I recently purchased because this has to do with the stitch sampler. So let me get those right here. nose is running like a freight train okay let me do this one first one of the books that I ordered I love to order the old older books when I find them uh, because you can't um, some of the things that they mention in these books you can't find in current editions and so I like to go back and see you know what they what they did you know what kind of stitches they used, explanations you know those kinds of things and they're usually a treasure trove so what I did is I ran across these two books um, I just I went into kind of a, a book frenzy which I do occasionally because I just love books but this particular time um, I ran across these books on cross stitch now I know embroidery is the thing right now and I love to do embroidery too I think it's beautiful uh, but my love is cross stitch and if yours is too I got this book next steps in cross stitch and this is by what's her first name Angela Beasley okay this was May or this was published in the 1990s so it's not real real old but you know uh, and, and, and I got through this third-party thing through Amazon, so uh, you can still order them. Uh, this is a beautiful edition. It came perfect. Uh, but what I wanted you to know is that she has got a lot of cool stuff in here. Now, I don't know if you can see this or not, but on the cover, that's a waterfall. And I think it looks just like a waterfall. So... She has got different things, different techniques in here that you can utilize. Uh, one of the things that she had in here that I thought was really amazing, because that's right up our uh, mixed media alley, is she had a pattern where she used paint on her background. Now, you, can't, you may not be able to see it too well here, but that cat is on a windowsill. And, of course, the little thatched roof there uh, is done in, I guess, you know, straight stitch, long stitch. I don't, I'm not sure, satin stitch. But she actually painted uh, little dibs and dabs on the wall with paint. So it's got this, like, this little, you know, soft pinky thing, you know, to it. And uh, I, back in the 90s, I had no idea that there was somebody doing that. So, uh, and she goes into, you know, doing some ribbon work. She's got some gold work in there. She's got some inter interesting stitches. So I'm real anxious to, you know, try uh, a few of these. You know, I have no intention of going through and doing all those projects. But uh, the stitches that she uses, I'm, I, I would like to experiment with those. Now, the next one that I got, and, it, and I liked it because, you know, it's, more than the fundamentals. It's not, okay, you know, this is how you do an X. It is about doing different stitches in the cross-stitch family on cross-stitch material. And that's what um, I've been kind of looking for. So, uh, very good book. If you can, see if you can uh, find a copy. Uh, cross-stitch Plus is the next one. Now, this is by two ladies. This is also back from the 90s. Uh, Lindsay Fox and Heather Sprout. Uh, I'll have this information on my blog, too. Now, they use... Uh, one of the things that really fascinated me when I got this is they've got a counted satin stitch alphabet sampler in there. And I'm really anxious to use uh, the satin stitch in my work because I think that, you know, that technique really does lend a lot of interest. And... Something else that they did that I thought was really fascinating is they did, I don't know if you can see it or not, but 
that fairy has got black work around it. Now, it's not your typical looking black work. What they did is they used a white piece of floss with that and made it look like lace around that border as a border. Really beautiful. I would have never thought of that, you know, because black work usually have, you know, like birds or something, you know, houses and, you know, not to destroy Barrage that, but it is um, like the same thing over and over again. You know, when I saw them use something like this, I thought, wow, that's awesome. So they have a lot of interesting techniques in here, too, for counted uh, cross stitch for uh, counted work. Now, even though I'm going to look at those for some, some interesting stitches, uh, I'm, that's not going to be a blow-by-blow blow book to follow for me, books, either one of those. However, this is going to be the one, the proper stitch. This is, uh, to me, uh, Jane Greenoff's book, The, um, the Cross-Stitch Bible, and this one are two have-to-have books if you're going to be doing counted cross-stitch because if you have these you're not going to need any other books. This this is like an investment for all for all other instruction books. I'm this is the one I'm going to follow. I'm going to be doing this in the order that it is in this book. And I got to tell you something. If it ain't in here, you don't need it because and the instructions are just awesome in here. They've got what the back should look like. Um, they've got some of the things that they put in there is how change, when you change threads, you know, how you're supposed to do that. Ending your threads. Turning corners. Wow. Uh, and difficulties and hints. So, you know, I mean, how to start. How to do the stitch. How the back is supposed to look. I mean, you got all these things. Look at these. I mean, these are wonderful instructions. You know, all of those little stitches, you probably can't see it, but they're all numbered, you know. So you know, okay, up at one, down at two. That's how I have to learn. You know, if you just show me, you know, okay, here, this is what it looks like. Yeah, I'm going to get nowhere fast. But something like this I can utilize. And I am going to, when I start my stitch sampler, I'm going to be going uh, through this book. Uh, page by page by page and stitch by stitch by stitch. So uh, if you want to, if you want to invest in that and, you know, stitch along with me for a stitch sampler, then I think we're going to have a lot of fun with that because that really is an awesome book. Okay. So let's see what else is happening here. Two things. Well, before I get to those two things, let me just do this real quick. I took a mixed media class, and I got to tell you, it was a lot of fun. I'm really glad I took it. I took it. A friend of mine, you know, was going to take it and asked me if I wanted to. And I said, you bet. Uh, just because I think anytime you can think outside the box, you know, it, it, it helps you in what you're currently doing. So I took this mixed media class, and... I realized that painting really isn't my thing, you know, as far as wanting to do, you know. Now, the mixed media, I love because, you know, we could throw a lot of stuff on here. But as far as, you know, just, you know, working on canvas and stuff like that, I, I could never just be a straight painter, you know, somebody who sketches, you know, something like that. Um, I got to have a whole bunch of stuff, you know, going on with it. And... Um, but I enjoyed this. This is what my finished work looked like. Okay. This is just, this is cut out. This is tissue. This is tissue paper. This is collage paper. And this is collage paper around here too. And so is this. And I just painted around it. These are skeleton leaves. If you've never had uh, skeleton leaves, I got it. Let me tell you something about skeleton leaves. Okay, of course. And I, I brought my Martha Stewart paints. I'm comfortable with them, you know. I love Martha Stewart paints. I love the colors they come in, you know, and they really are very versatile, too. You can use them on fabric. Um, but uh, 
skeleton leaves. If you get an opportunity to ever purchase those, and I got them because I thought, you know, hey, maybe I could use paint, you know, to kind of fasten them to a project in the future sometime. So I got these a long time ago. I'm surprised they're still intact because they've been thrown around so much. But I got to tell you, skeleton leaves, they're pretty tough little critters. When I was painting these, when I was gluing them, you know, onto the project, um, and let me tell you something, these little canvases, I'll paint on these all day long. They were fun because they were small, and um, and that made it fun, you know. I mean, when you're doing a big project, you know, like this, it really uh, didn't really ring my bell. But, you know, small canvases like this, I was thinking, oh, you could do some really cute little patterns and then, you know, plaster a big one with it because it has depth and shape to it, you know, that's why. But these skeleton leaves, I must have gone over those, I couldn't even tell you. I What happened is, I don't like glue, but I had to glue it on there, so I used Elmer's glue because that's what the instructor wanted us to use on these. And so I had some at home, so I went ahead and I threw them on these little canvases and glued them down, put too way too much glue on them. So I had to sit there with water and a rag, go over it, dilute it, clean the brush, try to get more of the glue off of there, and it took forever, and I must have gone over it 50 times at least. And so I thought, you know, there were several times when I was going back over it, and I thought, if there's going to be anything left of this leaf, it's going to be a miracle. I never, it never shredded. I mean, for these things to be skeletonized, you would think that those veins would be extremely fragile, but they're not, you know, I mean, I guess short of just crumpling them up in your hand, they're very tough little objects. And they, they really did take a beating on my end. Of course, I, I took some to the class and handed them out to the my classmates. Uh, and it was only a three-night class over a three-week period. So, you know, it wasn't like, you know, we were going to be friends for life or anything. But we were able to bring stuff in if some other people. And I had had these so long and never used them. I thought, what the heck, you know. Um, so I hope that they had the same kind of good luck with them that I did. I told them, I said... Don't be afraid to, to do with these because they really are made to last. And uh, maybe it's the type of leaf that they use. Uh, but regardless, uh, if you've ever seen them, if you've ever wanted to play with them, don't be afraid of them because they're they're tough little buggers. Uh, oh, and the class was fabulous. I had a great time. I really enjoyed it. The uh, instructor, Gabby, she was extremely uh, helpful and full of information and really encouraged us to think outside the box. And I think that that is invigorating to do something different. You know, it may not be your cup of tea, but it does cause, I think, you to, uh, for the juices to flow uh, a little bit faster, a little bit better in your own work because you've been stimulated by by this uh, in a creative way. And so that's going to stimulate whatever it is you love and you're working on. Um, so anyway, so I enjoyed it. If you get a chance, do something different. Um it, it makes you realize how much you love what you do as opposed to what you think may be out there. Uh, if you try it, you know, hey, this isn't this isn't for me. Uh, and then, you know, you realize that what you're doing really is something that you love and are passionate about. So, you know, it does, it, there's a lot of avenues of discovery, you know, with that. Now, here's the next thing. I'm trying to get through this as fast as I can, folks. I don't want this to drag out forever. Uh, oh. Updates on Ladybug Late. Because of my eyes, I haven't really been able to work on it because it is just too hard, even with a magnifier, uh, to see the detail of those holes. And I'm just one of these, I, if I can't do quality work, I'm, I'm not going to do it. So that's still ongoing. But I really want to get that done because there is a exhibition in Oklahoma coming up that I, I want to participate in. I want to, it's a juried 
you know, so, you know, you might, you might not get in, but I really do want to submit it at least, um, to be evaluated. And then if I make it into the show, then, you know, Hey, that would be absolutely fabulous. But, um, I do want, at least want to get it to the stage where it can be judged. So, I'm going to be working on that very hard after I get my eyes fixed, which hopefully will be next month. Um, oh, I don't know what that was. That just fell down, but okay. I hope I can find it. Uh, same for Eastern Expressions. I haven't really done uh, a whole lot with that either, but um, I've got all of my everything ready to go on that. I've got my fabric. Everything is, is ready to go. Something I want to share with you, if you haven't looked at it yet, and of course, I'm usually behind the times on a lot of this stuff, but um, DMC has got an Instagram site, and I want to tell you, I got started, I, I ran across it accidentally, which is, happens to me a lot on online, but they really had, I mean, I could have sat there, of course, you know, they probably got like a billion different pictures on it, but I could have sat there all day and looked through that, you know. They had some of the most beautiful work on there, and uh, if you don't, if you haven't checked it out, check it out because it was just a lot of fun to go through there and see the work of all these other uh, stitchers. You know, I mean, I, I'm just always so blown away by the by the talent that is out there. You know, I love to see it because it's so diverse and it's just so remarkable you know beautifully done and um so if you get a chance check out the dmc instagram site uh, i'll try to have a link uh on that on my blog i should i should have it you know i i just didn't write it down so um look for that on the blog uh okay the very last thing i wanted to talk about well, actually, almost the last thing um, is I wanted to let you know uh, about, uh, okay, I love Fabergé. I love Fabergé since uh, I read about uh, the work that they did for the czars many, many years ago. You know, I read a book on the Romanovs and, you know, I was reading about that and did some more research and I just fell in love with Fabergé. Fabergé, anything, Okay. Uh, they have got on on the uh, UK Fabergé site, uh, they have got, uh, uh, hopefully they still have it on there, it's a pearl egg. It's a Fabergé pearl egg. Now, this is just an art object. Uh, and uh, these eggs, you know, uh, from even back then, they ha they were mechanical. In other words, you push a button, you know, and all these things, you know, automatically, you know, do whatever they're supposed to do. So this Fabergé egg, go uh, if you want to see a beautiful piece of art, check out the pearl, the Fabergé pearl egg. It's encrusted with. Uh, gemstones, precious gemstones, as well as the enamel work that they're famous for, the gold work, uh, the pearls that are on it are spectacular. And then in the very center, there is like this black pearl, this very special, beautiful black pearl. And uh, and I love Tahitian pearls. I think, I think they're just absolutely one of nature's most gorgeous gifts for us. Uh, so this is this little black pearl. Uh, they call them black pearls, but it's, you know, actually a little gray pearl. Check it out, check it out, check it out. They also have got some seasonal eggs uh, that they've produced, and those are gorgeous as well. You know, check out the whole site, you know. I was going to try to have a picture of it for you, but, you know, it's one of those moving things uh, where you can't get a still photo uh, and so I thought, no, you're just going to have to go to the website and check it out. But take my word, you're going to be blown away because it is just a, a, just a beautiful piece of artwork. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about is, and this is going to be for the next uh, video, because this really does deserve to be on a video rather than just on the blog. 
I years years ago, um, I used Tattered Angels uh, Glimmer Mist. I really loved them. They they really do a beautiful job. I don't know how they must put a ton of mica in it because it really does sparkle like crazy. Uh, I kind of got away from them for a while, and once again, I w was on Joggles, because I go there. Uh, she has a weekly video, so whenever I see the video, I go to her shop. And they had a deal on uh, a product, a couple of products from Tattered Angels, who makes Glimmer Mists, uh, Glamour Glaze, and what was the other one? Let's see. Oh, my stuff is falling down. It's going to be fun picking all that up. Okay. Okay, Glimmer Glaze. Okay, that's what that looks like. Glimmer Glaze. Tattered Angels. You can see it on there. Kind of small. Here is the other thing. Oh, Glimmer Glam. Okay, so you can see that's a bigger bottle. Glimmer Glam. So Barb had it on sale at Joggles. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to order me some of that. You know, because it's like half price, 50% off. So I went ahead and I ordered it. Ordered, you know, as much as I could. So, and it was really a great bargain. Uh, so I, I ordered some of that. And then in that vein, I went to the Tattered Angels website. And I discovered something that is just going to blow you away. Like I said, I'm way behind. You may already be aware of this. I wasn't, but I'm going to explore uh, a technique with Tattered Angels that I think anybody can use uh, in their fiber art. I, I'm just so excited about this. I actually ordered something from uh, Tattered Angels that um, has got a, like a complete kit, you know, that you can do this uh, certain effect with. And I can't wait to get my hands on it uh, so I can play with it. I'll go into that on the next video because I want to play with that and I have a couple of different projects that I can utilize that technique on and so I'm real excited you know about getting that you know and getting my hands on it getting getting my hands dirty you know with the mixed media with with the paint of course you know got you gotta have paint so anyway uh that is let me make sure, you know, because I don't want to finish this up and then go, oh, gosh, I forgot that. Um, you know what? That looks, that looks like, I think I got everything in that. Wow. Okay, wonderful. I hope that this didn't drag on and on. But like I said, we had a lot of stuff to talk about. And I wanted to make sure that I squeezed it all in here because um, hopefully... Uh, no, by next month, you know, I will have my cataracts removed and, you know, I'm going to be able to really push forward with a lot of this stuff uh, instead of, you know, having to, you know, have like three magnifying glasses to see something. It's just crazy. So, uh, so anyway, I, I hope, you know, that you, I hope I didn't sniff too much through this. Uh, but like I always say, please, if you have any questions, concerns, uh, constructive criticism, comments, you know, please feel free to leave those. Um, I love hearing from you guys. I think it's fabulous that you're out there and that you've taken an interest. Uh, and I really do hope uh, that you're getting something out of this uh, because I certainly am, you know, by doing these different things and telling you about it, it's actually educating me too. So, you know, we're both I guess, getting, getting something out of it. And, um, and I guess with that, you know, I'm going to close this, this particular video. And, uh, again, I appreciate you watching and please keep creating. Thank you. And bye-bye.